Hey everybody, this is RK. I got here a ColecoVision Experience magazine, which sort of follows along what Atari was doing when they were coming out with their magazine, Atari Age. This was the first issue, Premier Collector's Issue, and I must have taken that seriously because I collected it. I collected, of the three issues they came out with, I collected this one. And I think I sent in a coupon. Is that how it, this worked? I sent in a coupon from when I bought my ColecoVision and I got this. I, for some reason, did not subscribe to it. I don't know. Uh, I just never got around to it. But this is interesting because it's a nice magazine. It's uh, kind of slick. It came with some things, which for some, <laughs> I don't know why I still have them. The uh, ColecoVision... Got to get home to, to my ColecoVision lenticular card here with the animation of uh, Cat and Mouse from Mousetrap, Angel and Devil from Pepper 2, Mario, and Donkey Kong. It also came with book covers. I was out of school, so I didn't I didn't put these on my on my book. So here they are: name, book title. Got to get home to my ColecoVision. Not bad book covers. They're kind of durable. Um, again, the same character lineup. Here's another one. And it also came with an iron-on t-shirt uh, transfer that uh, I obviously never used. These were tucked inside this magazine. And this magazine was put in a drawer of things that I would uh, hang on to. And they're still here. So in the ColecoVision experience, uh, they tease you with the best is yet to come. And I imagine since this is 1983 that uh, this they're talking, they're teasing about the Atom computer. They talked about turbo road racing action on your TV screen. The new controller that was coming out, the action, super action controller. It was kind of, you know, this was a sales pitch. It was, I already had the ColecoVision, but clearly Coleco was getting ready to sell a lot more things. The uh, module number three, which was the expansion, so that you could play Super Game Wafers, which eventually, I, I, I'm not sure they ever came out with those. I think they were, they were changed to tapes that were used on the Atom. I did have the 2600 expansion. What's new? They talked about the different video games that were coming out. I think I had most of these. I, I did have Slither. It came with the roller controller. Looping, which was weird and hard, but addictive. All kinds of things. Space Fury, Victory, Gorf, Donkey Kong Jr., Pepper 2. So they talked about all these the sports games. I don't remember the skiing game. I don't remember this one. So they talked about, you know, what, what the other magazines were doing at the time, what the arcade hits were up and coming for the ColecoVision. Um, what's, you know, write in, what's your favorite ColecoVision game and why? They were trying to communicate with their buyers, get a kind of an idea of what would sell and uh, start a two-way communication. Since this was way early pre-internet, like by 15 years, uh, this uh, this is how they did it in those days. It was feedback. I always love feedback. I always love people writing in. I always wondered, like, do these people really write in or do the editors write this? Like, where do they get these questions from if this was issue number one? So I suspect that maybe some of these were written by the people putting this magazine together, at least for the first issue. They had strategy tips, how to beat Zaxxon. How to Beat Donkey Kong. This was fun stuff to read. Again, there was no internet. This is what we had. You could buy electronic game magazines or, or any of the other magazines that were on the market. Uh, you know, this, this was just fun stuff. It, when you couldn't play your ColecoVision or whatever, you, you, you had these uh, magazines. And the best was yet to come, The Atom, which <laughs> I was all in for, but uh, turned out not to be the computer I ended up getting. And apparently a lot of other people didn't either, but... Anyway, um, so that's the ColecoVision experience, which I still have hanging around. The other, the other uh, which is more of a book, was uh, the Editors of Consumer Guide put out Personal Computers and Games. This is a guide of how to buy one. 
Uh, there was a store back then called the Paperback Booksmith. This, by the way, is from 1981. It was look at sale price, sale price. This was marked down twice at Paperback Booksmith. Then, if you were in Massachusetts, you might remember a store, a chain of stores called Building 19, where you get good stuff cheap. And they have it marked down to a dollar. And that's where I finally picked this up. And I already had a Coleco, uh, I'm sorry, I already had a Commodore 64, but I just couldn't resist this. Notice the spiral binding. A lot of computer manuals had the spiral binding so that it could lay flat. So you could open it up and it would just lay flat. And I think this was the idea behind this so that you could study it, whatever. So this is just a book I picked up on Impulse. It was mostly about what personal computer you could buy uh, that was good for games. Now, in those days, you know, there were a variety of computers. People typically didn't have computers at home. Uh, they might have had a computer on the job. Uh, they might have been curious about a computer. Everybody, I think, most people, I know my introduction to having a home computer was a game console. And this book talked about the limitations and expense of a game console and for about the same amount of money, you could buy a personal computer and this was going to guide you through the different kinds of personal computers. And they explain why computers were more affordable, that the price of chips had gone down and there was more power in a computer. And if you wanted to play a game, a computer was the way to go. And then if you had the computer, then you could expand to do it, things that you might want to do around the house or with business or whatever. So this was the idea. So they, they explain this whole history of the RAM chip and and what the hardware was and explaining the different terms, what a monitor was, a peripheral, a program, RAM, reset, ROM. We did not know much about computers in those days. This was all new territory. So think guides like this were popping up. So the first one that they talk about here is they talk about Apple computers. And they talk about the pros and cons. And they profile every computer that they feature in here with the same questions. Here are the models how to build a game system, the cost, game software, advantages of having an Apple, disadvantages, what else can I do with it? And this was for the Apple IIe. Then they covered Atari computers. And it says here, a company official once referred to the Atari machines as home computing toasters. This every appliance idea pretty well sums up Atari's philosophy. Atari computers were designed as the first true home systems, which, you know, is true. I think, I think also Apple, especially when things like the Macintosh came along, they wanted to make computers as, as common as having a toaster around the house, an appliance. Uh, the thing is, is that back then, I thought computing, because it was new and it was sort of an outgrowth of game consoles, I found computers to be more fun. They were exploratory. They were, you know, experimental. You, you were trying to figure out how you could fit it into your life. They were hobbyists that were using them. Today, they are so common that uh, the computers are everywhere, and we all have. To, most of us have to depend on them for work in one form or another. We carry around a computer in in the form of our smartphone, and um, they're, they're a necessity now. But then I don't think there was much fun. I think they were more fun back then in the 8-bit days when we were doing all the exploring and playing with them. So they talk about uh, Commodore computers, IBM computers. IBM, was this was pre-Windows. So if you wanted a business machine, it was you get an IBM. Uh, this was before all the clones. Radio Shack computers, the TRS-80. Texas Instrument Computers, which, after I read all this, this was sort of kind of a limited computer. And then they rate the systems. So you're considering buying a computer back then, and Group 1, gaming only. And the order, like, if you're going to buy a computer and primarily use it for games, their first group, gaming only, listing in order of suitability. Top of the list, Atari 400-800 computers. Then the Commodore VIC-20, followed by the Commodore 64, Apple IIe, Radio Shack TRS-80 color computer, Texas Instruments, IBM PC. Now, over here, if you wanted to do a little bit of both, this group here was for game and home slash business applications. The Apple IIe came in first. Radio Shack came in second. Third was the IBM PC Atari 400-800 
dropped down to fourth on the list. Commodore 64, Texas Instruments, Commodore VIC-20. And then if you just strictly wanted business and only business, IBM PC, Apple IIe, Radio Shack, Atari 400-800, Commodore, Texas Instruments. And at the bottom, interestingly enough, they have Commodore VIC-20. I believe the Commodore VIC-20 had, what, 16K of memory? I never had one. I did have the Commodore 64, so... I imagine the VIC-20 was a good introductory computer, but most people were probably just playing games with them back then. Then they start talking about the game types, because this is about what kind of computer to, to buy and how you can play the games. So they talk about adventure games first, and they cover the text adventures and Zork, and they even talk about strategies and how to figure out these games. Then they talk about the different popular games for adventure games with... A little blurb underneath, a little, a little column underneath uh, an image, and if they and if they didn't have a screenshot, they would just throw in a picture uh, and explain, you know, what kind of adventure games you could play. Then they covered educational games and which computers were, were great for education. And I don't remember these these programs, Snooper Troopers. I mean, when I think of an educational game that kids played in school back then, I think of um, Oregon Trail, which maybe came a little after 1983. But with Color Logo uh, for Radio Shack, um, Ernie's Quiz, Gertrude's Puzzles, you know, Sesame Street Mix and Match, Tic Tac Show, Tic Tac, Tic Tac Show, yeah. Maze Games, of course. And Top of the Heap, the best one that they came across was the best maze game was Pac-Man. And they have a whole strategy in here for Pac-Man. And this is clearly the Pac-Man for from Atari, for Atari computers. And, you know, incidentally, it's probably the same program as the uh, 5200. But they have a whole how to beat it strategy, uh, different patterns, when the ghosts first come out of the box, what to do. If the, if the ghosts are slowly come out of the box, what to do. Um, so there's a whole strategy in here for how to, how to play Pac-Man and get somewhere with it. And again, they talk about the different games. Space games, new, new game type, game type four, space games. Uh, they talk about different space games like Star Trek, Asteroids, Defender, Galaxian. Their, uh, their best space game they lead off with, Star Raiders. Absolutely the cream of the crop, according to them, which it is. If, if you haven't played Star Raiders, you need to play it. Uh, here are screenshots from Atari Star Raiders for the Atari computers. Incidentally, same screenshots you would get for the Atari 5200. And then they do, they do cover some of the games. Asteroids, Galaxian, Gauntlet, Gorf, Omega Race, Parsec, Space Invaders, Zaxxon. Again, interesting, they don't have screenshots for Gauntlet or Parsec. They drop in some clip art and they, uh, they drop in this, uh, these waveforms here for Zaxxon. They didn't have a screenshot of Zaxxon. I imagine those waveforms are representing the force field on the uh, walls. Strategic role-playing games. The best role-playing game, Wizardry, according to them. And they explain, again, how to play strategic role-playing games. These were the popular games of the time. Alibaba and the Forty Thieves, Deadline, Eastern Front, Galactic Empire. Um, Temple of Apshe, which I played on, on different... Uh, Different consoles. I think. I think. It, it, I believe it came out for the ColecoVision. Um, yeah, it did, and I did play it on that. Theme games. I don't even re recall. I, I maybe it was th these games could not be put into a category, so they came up with theme games. But their best theme game was Minor Twenty Forty Nine, or which I considered a platform game. So they, t yeah, they talk about Minor Twenty Forty Nine er. Uh, saying it was similar to Donkey Kong, which I was similar as far as that it had, you know, platforms that you ran around on. But they went all out here on how to beat Minor 2049 or uh, as far as like the different levels of the game. And they lettered in order where to jump to. And they explain it down here. Go down the ladder and fall off the stairs onto the right. Don't worry, the fall is not far enough to kill you. I mean, they go into explicit detail, <clears throat> excuse me, of how to beat this game. So different theme games. Centipede. Uh, I think that's kind of a shooter. 
Choplifter, Flight Simulator. That would be simulation games. But for some reason, they felt uh, theme games was the category that they needed for this. Indoor Soccer, Nautilus, Picnic Paranoia, Sea Dragon, Rack 'em Up, where they kind of go into like how physics and, you know, physics in tapping a ball and, and how they never expected to see something like this on a computer, but uh, the coding was very good to simulate that and how difficult it was to program something like that. So at the time of the press of uh, printing this back in 83, they, they gave a review of new systems that weren't included in the initial choices. And here they talk about Spectra Video Computer, which has sort of, uh, they explain it's sort of um, a utility type of keyboard and a joystick. And the next level up, which uh, I guess this one could be expanded to 256K of RAM, um, the next level up had a regular keyboard that you could type on and no joystick and instead it was a numerical keypad over here and they talk about the prices of the games and uh, how like 256 ram is sort of like a lot of memory back then nec computers uh they are a uh, according to them they're a manufacturer of large computers nec aren't they isn't nec do they make cash registers i'm I, I don't remember. I'm not sure. Uh, that, that's what I think of when I think of NEC. Um, but, you know, d reading this, tape drives were like a a um, a peripheral that would give you more flexibility, uh, bigger programs, bigger games, because they could hold, you know, it, it could uh, hold more memory, I guess. Uh, cartridges were handy and quick, but they were limited in how much memory could go into a cartridge. They explain in here that the whole idea is to get away from cartridges, as in a um, just buying a dedicated console. But they also explain in here that at that time, that disk drive-based games were getting very popular and programs. And you could buy a disk drive, but beware that the disk drive could cost more than the computer itself, probably because the disk drive had moving parts in it where the, the computer didn't. Mattel computers, here they talk about the Aquarius computer. Um, and then of course they talk about Coleco computers, the Atom. And they talk about the two forms of the Atom, the expansion to the ColecoVision itself or buying a complete computer that includes all the memory so you don't have to use a ColecoVision. So they talk about that and they were pretty excited about that, but they had some warnings about how they hadn't actually seen anything really working correctly. And they, so they, you know, they kind of, they kind of forecast what eventually happened with Atom computers. Anyway, you got a directory of game software manufacturers. Some are long gone, like Atari themselves, but Spinnaker, I remember Spinnaker, they were in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Radio Shack, Tandy in Texas, but, you know, Epics, Texas Instruments. So this was a handy guide back in 1983 because nobody really knew a whole lot about computers. Both of these are something from a time capsule. I'm glad I hung on to them for whatever reason I hung on to them for. Here they are. It's nice looking back, especially in this day and age of uh, taking computers for granted and they're everywhere in our pockets, in, in our car dashboards, they're, they're just everywhere. Anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks for watching.